Thank you. It is a true honor to be part of this initiative, celebrating the work and the spirit of Paolo Freire. I want to thank Anna and Thomas for your kind invitation to contribute to this conversation. We understand Freire's work as classic and fundamental in how we think about development, social change, and how we engage in critical communication scholarship. I first came across Ferry's work in the book Pedagogy of the Press when I was an undergraduate in the early 80s, walking through a library where I found the book right next to those of Hamill Lincoln Downing. And that all inspired me to create an interdisciplinary major in communication that at that time did not exist. This was very fundamental to my future career. And it's not just the text, but the context. We understand the contemporary relevance of what Freire is engaging with, thanks to Anna Thomas's recent publication and the contributors of that volume. I do wanna start with a disclaimer. I am pronouncing Freire in a way that rhymes with prairie, and I'm doing so intentionally, this accent um, helps us to understand his geographical reach around the world, but also accentuates my own positionality. So this is an interesting and important focus. The ontological call brings to light the calls for humility, empathy, hope, dialogue, and love. So love, this is the subject here. Why me? I have to tell you that my daughter asked that question right away, um, being concerned that I was asked because I'm a woman. And I need to tell you that although usually my critical feminist stance would be right there, I don't feel that way at all. I actually feel like this is a challenge and an incredibly important subject. But I will also ask you in advance for your forgiveness and patience as I offer some tentative propositions. I see love as foundational for all of the other themes that we're considering. There is no empathy without love. Humility comes from love. We engage in dialogue through love. And it is because of love that we have hope. Now, my second disclaimer is that we are recording this on the day after Valentine's Day. And I wanna be absolutely clear, I'm not talking about a commodification of love but the love that's described in the work we're engaging here, which is about respect and relationships. So I'd like to talk about Freire's call for love as an ontological principle, first in terms of social change, and then in terms of communication. So love in social change, first, manifest through relationships, second, understood through contexts, and third, requiring responsibility to act. So first, love manifests through relationships. We articulate love through our experiences. As Anna and Thomas write, we're talking about the value of relationships over the rigor of discipline. I wanna begin though with an epistemology of intersubjectivity, the way Wittgenstein reminds us that language connects us. I would say that the communication is about words, but it's also about the creation of numbers and visual images and narratives. So our relationships are understood then as a political and social construction of reality that then becomes our ontology. Now, a second piece of their engagement with this work suggests that collective ties include all beings, human or not. And I think this is a really interesting and important part of the argument here. We have a social relationship, but we also are in nature dealing with climate change, dealing with health issues that involve plants and animals, air, water. This is all part of our context. There's another piece of this that I think could get complicated and that's artificial intelligence and robots. Here I'm reminded of C.S. Hamlet's work, um, Conversations with His Robot, in which he talks about having a robot at home and the robot asking for another robot so they could talk about him, the human. I bring this up because our relationships with not only humans, I think needs to be understood in a very complicated way. So the second piece of this is that love is understood in context. And here I like Freire's suggestion that we're reading the world before reading the word. This is important. 
When we're thinking about love connecting reason with senses, that's an important way of engaging our experience. And I would argue that critical research must do the same thing. Analyses with evidence and experience that is not distant, but engaged. This begins with listening because our experiences are really different from one another. So we can't rely on our own solitary experience. So voice, and here I rely on Nick Calder's work, leads to listening and dialogue. And a couple of things I'd like to highlight here. In my early 20s, I felt a crusade based on my personal experience and went to Cairo to work with women, thinking that what everybody needed was reproductive health. And I had to listen and learn that basic health was much more important uh, to the community with which I was working. I'm also wanting to suggest that we need to structure in listening with this experience. I was editor of communication theory and I'm very proud first of the special issue edited by Flor Engel and Becerra on Latin American communication theory. And right now we have a new edition devoted to the global South edited by Mohan Dada and Mohaya Pal with a great article by Pradeep Thomas on development about the imperialism of categories. But I also want to add another layer that problematizes this, and that's mediation. We have personal experience, we have listening and dialogue, but mediation is complicated because we are talking about structures. Digital media can connect us just as much as it can engender surveillance. The platforms structure our interaction as well as our memory and through archives. Now, the third piece of this, you know, love is understood in relationships and context, but the third piece is that love requires us to be responsible through advocacy and action. And this is classic for me. For reflection, action, in a recursive process, and understanding that no action is action. So this is all also important in Ferry's work, recognizing the relationships of power and critical to love. How do we have the ability to express our love and to act on our love? All of this is predicated on power structures. And I'm thinking of Foucault here and an architecture of observation, but an architecture that also structures our possibilities. So next I'd like to talk about how we understand love then in our approach to communication. And here I want to think about first how we relate, second how we create, and then third how we translate. So we relate, and the argument inspired by Ferrari here is that we relate through compassion, not commodification and objectification, with personal connection, not material acquisition. But here I, I want to foreground that it does matter that we have labor conditions that produce communication, communication technologies, structures that inhibit access, as well as the material artifacts that are then left behind causing pollution and health concerns. And there I'm thinking of um, Miller and Maxwell's work. So that's how we relate in communication. Then there is how we create. And how we create, I wanna say, is based on first, and ethics of care, and second, credibility. With ethics of care, I like going back to Carol Gilligan's early work um, concerning compassion and empathy as important values. But I do not want to say women are more nurturing than men, because I think that reinforces problematic gender stereotypes. But rather, I'd like to say from a critical feminist standpoint, relationships matter. We are who we are through communication. And the ethics of care has been taken up and applied in many fields, including geographies of ethics. We do need to understand the real labor conditions that go into this context of creation. And here I'll use the new film Radio Girls as an illustration. In the film Radio Girls, it talks about the real life conditions of young women who worked in factories creating clocks and the the real health consequences they had for being in that factory. And I think it's an interesting story for us here because the creation of a clock matters and a clock is an ultimate communication device. The second piece of that though, is that credibility matters. We need to be transparent about how we know what we know and how we share sources and experiences. So we're navigating credibility with that ethics of care. 
The third piece then is how do we translate? How do we understand and share the information we have? And here we're thinking of empathy, not empire, working in connection with, not domination through. Freire here inspires our work in critical communication literacies, understanding that literacy requires critical analysis. I wanna add here that it matters how we understand media here. So I wanna think about mediation here in a way that understands media, not as reflecting reality on a mirror, but as a refraction through a prism, and that the prism refracts colors and ideas and images in a way that the prisms produce prejudice in ways that are very problematic. So the role of communication here, again, is in a truly Frarian spirit. spirit. This enables our access to the production of knowledge. It enables voice and narrative and enables critical analysis of the world. The implication of how we understand love in terms of its contribution to social change and to communication social change, critique is love. The importance of critique is quite vivid in Freire. Critique is essential to our process of education and how we understand the world. Critique is important to how we understand and try to solve social problems. Implicit bias has to be part of this understanding. And some recent work I think is part of this conversation I'm inspired by Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast the Origins of Discontents, and Paolo Ramos's book, Finding Latinx. So our step forward, Freire reminds us to become more fully human. And Sylvia Westford suggests that communication is how we learn to be human. So I just want to add that love is also how we learn to be human because love offers purpose as well as process. Why do we want to be more fully human? We need to create a world in which we have dignity and respect, a world in which our basic needs are met. So we're not victim to algorithms but advocates for better conditions. So in conclusion, love may sound nice, almost trivial, but it's the biggest challenge of all. Love is forged and sustained in changing relationships that involve sacrifice and forgiveness because we care about the bigger picture. Love requires responsibility that we advocate and act. So in conclusion, love is a power that cultivates humility through our understanding of our position in the world. Love is a power that builds empathy through narrative. Love is a power that permits authentic dialogue. And love is a power that inspires hope for a better world. For all of our critiques about social and justice and our concerns for social justice, part of our constructive way forward must build on an understanding of love as power. Thank you.